Number 7. On a brisk Monday afternoon on February 28, 1983, in St. Louis, Missouri, two rummagers went looking for scrap metal for their car in the basement of an abandoned apartment building located at 5635 Clemens Avenue. One of the individuals pulled out his lighter to light a cigarette, and that's when they stumbled upon a gruesome sight. There was an African-American girl, estimated to be between the ages of 8 to 11, and approximately 4'10 to 5'6 in height. She was wearing a blood-stained yellow v-neck sweater with no tags, and she was positioned face down with her pants and underwear removed. Her head had been decapitated, and mold was growing on her neck. There were two coats of red nail polish on her fingers, and her hands were bound by the wrists with red and white nylon rope. When homicide detectives arrived at the crime scene, they initially thought she could have been a sex worker until they examined the body and realized the victim hadn't gone through puberty. They determined she was beheaded elsewhere due to the lack of blood. They did find some traces of blood on the side of the walls leading to the basement that indicated she had been carried and her body brushed against it during the process. An autopsy conducted showed she had been raped and her cause of death was by strangulation three or five days prior to being found. As for the child's head, it was never recovered. Despite an extensive search, this hindered the investigation because dental examinations couldn't be provided, nor a facial reconstruction through forensic technology programming. The investigators scoured a list of all children at the surrounding schools, but everyone was accounted for. They proceeded to look through the database of missing children Yet there had been no reports of a young child matching her description being missing. Little Jane Doe's case quickly turned cold, and after 10 months of exhausting all possible leads and nobody coming forward to claim her body, she was buried in December of 1983 at Washington Park Cemetery in Berkeley, Missouri. In June of 2013, investigators exhumed the child's remains with the hope of gathering new forensic evidence. Jane Doe's remains were transported to the St. Louis Medical Examiner's Office, where researchers re-collaborated bone sampling and minerals to attempt to narrow down her native origins based on the water she had drunk. The testing revealed she had spent most of her life in one of the numerous southeastern states, including Georgia, Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas, Tennessee, Florida, Louisiana, and North or South Carolina. Though new scientific testing provided a glimmer of hope to the child's case, the police say it's rather unlikely she will be properly identified unless someone comes forward with vital information. Authorities suspected a family member may be involved due to no reports of a child being reported missing, but considering they were unable to determine where she was from, that theory was hard to substantiate. Little Jane Doe's case has never been solved. Number 6. The 1987 disappearance of an entire village in Shiangxi province in the Quinling Mountains is a story that is not exactly one about murder, but a mystery case that is still making its rounds in Chinese media. According to the local reports, it was a matter of one night when not only all thousands some people in the small Quinling village but also the cats, dogs, and livestock all had left without a trace. The story goes that various people had spotted unidentified flying objects above the village, a story that was later banned by the Chinese communist authorities, who codenamed the incident the Night Cat Incident. Some say the incident related to a top secret affair for which the villagers were displaced and told not to disclose the classified information to others. This corresponds with an older nearby villager who told reporters there were army troops in the vicinity that night, allegedly to transfer people to other places. In the end, it is unclear what is true and what is not true about this story almost turning it into a folktale of which the facts are unclear. The village is still abandoned to this day. 
Number five. The Wonderland Murders was an unsolved crime where four people were brutally killed in the Laurel Canyon area of Los Angeles, California on July 1, 1981. The true story of the Wonderland Murders involves drugs and drug dealers, an infamous porn star and one of the wealthiest, most powerful people in Los Angeles in the 70s and 80s, a skeevy businessman who owned a number of infamous Hollywood clubs, the killing, commonly referred to as the four on the floor murder, was vicious and bloody. Authorities never truly figured out who committed the crime, although they're fairly confident in their suspicions. The case involved the 80s famous porn star John Holmes, a person who was quite addicted to drugs, so addicted that he would go to extremes to get the money to buy them, including robbing the home of Eddie Nash, a very wealthy nightclub owner. Alongside with the Wonderland Gang, constituted by Ronnie Lee, Ron Lanius, the leader, Joy Audrey Goldmiller, the leaseholder, William Raymond, Billy Deverell, Lanius's right-hand man and Miller's live-in boyfriend, David Lind, and finally Tracy Ray McCourt. By June 1981, Holmes was in over his head in the world of drugs. He was severely in debt and was stealing cash from his dealings money which belonged to the Wonderland gang, to buy more drugs for himself. When the group realized what Holmes was doing, they took his keys to the Wonderland house, beat him up, and threatened his life if he didn't fix the situation. Knowing how dangerous the men were, Holmes was frightened, and he came up with a plan to assist the gang in robbing one of his wealthy acquaintances, who was known to keep a trove of drugs, money, and other valuables in his home. Holmes drew a map of the inside of his friend's house, which directed the Wonderland gang on where to find the valuables. At midnight on June 29, 1981, the group gave Holmes $400 to purchase drugs from his friend. He hung out with him for six hours, and upon leaving, made sure the back door was unlocked so the gang could gain entrance to the home. Armed with guns and fake police badges, Deverell, Lanius, McCourt, and Lind stormed Eddie Nash's house. Lind attempted to subdue one of Nash's bodyguards with handcuffs and accidentally shot him in the process. The men made their way to Nash's safe in his bedroom. They held Nash at gunpoint and forced him to give them the combination. The group made off with eight pounds of cocaine, heroin, 5,000 quaaludes, jewelry, guns, and over $100,000 in cash. Eddie Nash, however, believed that the Wonderland gang and John Holmes was involved in the robbery, and there are rumors that the group was seen using some of his jewelry. Two days after the robbery, on July 1, 1981, at 3 a.m., a group entered the townhouse at 8763 Wonderland Avenue and bludgeoned to death Lanius, Deverell, Miller, and Barbara Richardson. The weapons were believed to be hammers and striated metal pipes. Ron Lanius' wife Susan suffered severe brain damage in the attack, but ultimately survived and recovered. Although she was left with permanent amnesia regarding the night of her attack, had to have part of her skull surgically removed and lost part of one finger. Neither Lind nor McCourt was present for the attack. Though there were people hearing screams during that night, the bodies were only found in the morning by furniture movers after hearing Susan's moaning. It is believed that some neighbors went inside the house after the murder and saw the bodies but never called the police. Instead, they stole drugs and some valuable items from the house and for this reason, the crime scene was heavily contaminated. When police entered the home at Wonderland Avenue, the veteran officers of the LAPD were so shocked that they began calling them the four on the floor murders. The crime wasn't called the Wonderland murders until after the media got a hold of the news. They began videotaping as they walked through the house during their investigation. The house was ransacked. Many of the beds and floors were covered with books, papers, drawers, clothes, and even tools. The lights and televisions were left on, giving the scene of an eerie look. 
There were drug paraphernalia all through the house, on nightstands and tables. There was blood splatter soaked into the beds, carpet, and walls. All of the bodies were left either in the beds or on the floors where they died. The video footage was later used in court. The video shows Barbara Richardson first, whose head was covered and soaking in a puddle of blood. Barbara was still wrapped in a blanket on the floor just beside the couch. It appears as if she had just rolled off the couch during the attack. Ron Lanius, who was still on the bed covered up, was also covered in blood and unrecognizable. Susan Lanius was removed and rushed to the hospital before the video footage began, but the video shows the blood-stained wall where she was found in the room with Ron. Billy, Deverell, and Joy Miller were found in another room. Joy was on the bed, but the room was ransacked so badly that her body was covered with the debris. Billy was against the wall, also soaked in his own blood. The cause of death was blunt force trauma. The victim's faces were beaten so badly that fingerprints were used to determine identity. In March 1982, John Holmes was arrested and charged with four counts of murder. He spent almost four months in jail, but by June 25, 1982, he was found not guilty and was acquitted of all charges. In 1988, police were still working on the case and knew Holmes was a part of the Wonderland killings. By that time, Holmes, who suffered from AIDS, was terminally ill. Investigators went to the hospital where Holmes was staying and attempted to get a confession. Their efforts proved fruitless, as Holmes was still uninterested in helping them close the case. Holmes died on March 13, 1988, at the age of 43. Eddie Nash was tried for the Wonderland murders in 1991, but was acquitted. He denied having any involvement in the Wonderland killings, aside from sending people to the house to retrieve his stolen property. Although police were never officially able to prove that Nash was responsible for the Wonderland murders, he was a primary suspect. Authorities never discovered who exactly committed the crime. Number 4 On the night of January 10, 1996, Dio Aking fought with her roommates after they were punished regarding electronic equipment use. She decided to go outside for a walk to calm down. Aking walked out onto Qingdao Street wearing a red coat. She never returned. On January 19, after some heavy snow in Nanjing, a woman cleaning the road found a bag filled with 500 pieces of what she believed to be leftover animal meat slices. She took the bag home to wash the meat, but promptly called the police after discovering three human fingers in the bag. By the time she had called the police, they had been alerted about four other black bags in Nanjing containing human remains. It was determined that the human remains were those of Dayo Aking, after further searches, a king's remains were found in the area. She had been cut into over 2,000 pieces. Strangely, her heart, liver, and spleen were missing. Her head and some other parts of her body had been boiled. The bags had the words Shanghai and landscapes of Guilin printed on them. There were no clues as to who the perpetrator of the crime was. To this day, even after an extensive search, the police have not found the perpetrator of the crime. The popular web sleuth theory in China is that she was killed for black market organ harvesting. There was a historic intestine transplant surgery that matches with the timeline of the murder. Furthermore, the fact she was boiled would eliminate the traces of anesthesia. The doctor who performed the transplant committed suicide at the age of 85. Many people think the guilt of what he did caused him to take his own life. This theory has never been proven. The case has almost become a sort of urban legend in China, especially since she left wearing a red coat. In Chinese culture, red holds a very significant place, and it is associated with a god or a threatening ghost 
along with religious and spiritual significance. Despite extensive police research, there have been no leads to the murderer. Number three. On that Saturday, October 22, 1966, then 17 year old Jeanette Sims had been babysitting for a family that attended the Florida State football game. When the game ended and the family returned, she returned home with no one there to welcome her. Although the television was on, when she returned to her family's mural court home, no one was gathered watching it as she expected. She began walking through the house looking for them, and eventually entered her parents' bedroom. Sims found her father, Dr. Robert Sims, 42, lying atop the flowered bedspread, bound, blindfolded, and shot once in the head. On the beige carpet, she found her mother, Helen Sims, 34, bound, blindfolded, and shot twice in the head and once in her leg. Diagonal to her mother, Sims found her younger sister, Joy Lynn, 12, still in her nightgown. Joy had been shot in the head once and stabbed seven times in the abdomen. Her underwear was pulled down around her ankles. Urgently, Jeannie called the Beavis Funeral Home. It was customary at the time to use the local funeral home as an ambulance service. Rocky Beavis, 16, and his father were the first to arrive at the scene after Jeannie called. They were unable to save the father, Dr. Robert Sims, but Helen was transported to the hospital. She was in a coma and passed away nine days later, never able to speak of what happened to her and her family. Almost immediately, robbery was ruled out as a motive for the murders. There was no evidence of anything being moved around or stolen. There were no signs of forced entry and neighbors told authorities they had not seen or heard anything unusual around the time of the killings. The investigation had few leads for suspects. Police searched the area surrounding the house and even drained a pond in search of the murder weapon or other evidence. The case has never been solved, although it's been reopened numerous times. The Sims family was admired by their community and people were shaken to their core upon hearing of the murders. They were respected people and a close-knit family. Robert Sins is the director of data processing for the Florida Department of Education, and his wife, Helen, the former secretary at First Baptist Church of Tallahassee. The family was buried at Hebron Baptist Church Cemetery in Mississippi. There had been multiple persons of interest over the years, including a pastor that Helen Sims quit working for a short time before the murders a teenager who lived around the corner and committed a grisly murder years later, and a teen couple with specific case knowledge that was never made public. But there is no evidence that can link them to the murders. The case remains unsolved to this day. Number two. On November 5 of 2009, a 13-year-old boy named Kwang Ji Jun, the only son in his family, was found dead hanging from the roof at his home. Ji Jun was wearing a red dress, later identified as a relative's over a woman's black swimming suit, which was reportedly never traced. Two pieces of black cloth had also been used as breast padding. Ji Jun's body was hanging from the wooden beam, with both hands and feet tied firmly a weight tied around his feet. On October 25, 2009, before returning to school, the boy told his parents he was going to weed the old house next week. During the following week, his parents got no news from him and they started to get worried. On November 3, his father called him and no one answered. He contacted the school, but teachers told him the boy had been absent from school for four days. More than 30 students did not attend a class that week because of the flu epidemic. The Kwong's absence had been overlooked as a result. The father immediately went to their old house, where he found that the front door and side door were locked, but that the back door was open. Police investigated the scene and found no signs of property theft. The boy had 32 won in his pocket, and his cell phone was still in his school bag. In December of 2009, 
Chongqing police said they ruled out the possibility of murder or suicide after an investigation. Huang Zhijun was reportedly determined to have been killed accidentally. They allegedly told the father that his son was accidentally killed in some kind of game involving superstition, which did not constitute a crime. Some bizarre details in this case include that the boy had a small hole in his forehead when his body was found, and that the rope around his hands and feet was tied professionally with 12 loops. Medical examiners ruled that the boy had died on November 3 or 4 due to asphyxia. There are many theories and speculations online regarding this case. A majority of people say that the boy's death was caused by some kind of sinister, superstitious rite. Others connected to a dream the mother told reporters she previously had about a tall man wearing a hat and carrying a bag going into the back door of their old house. A villager later said they had seen a stranger in the area with a hat and a large bag. Police declined to investigate further. On Jihu, a popular Q&A site where amateur sleuths and conspiracy theorists frequently pull their insight, the most popular opinion is that the teenage Ji Jun had a secret sadomasochism fetish and had died of sexual asphyxia. Another tenuous theory held that Kuang's mother's first husband and eldest son had conspired to kill the boy in revenge over a dispute. However, police insisted the pair had an alibi. Some had tried to connect the case to those of other children who have allegedly died in strange and similar circumstances, including a five-year-old girl found hanging from a telegraph line in Zhejiang in 2010. She was rumored to be the eighth child in that country, surnamed Kai, whose bizarre and otherwise inexplicable demise had also been ruled accidental. None of these explanations have proved particularly convincing, however, and the case remains a near insoluble mystery to this day. Number 1 In 1984, an unemployed guy called Gunther Stahl he used to work as a technician in the food industry from Anshausen in Germany is suffering from paranoia. From time to time, he talks about them who want to hurt or kill him, but never says who they are. On the 25th of October, 1984, around 11 p.m., while his wife is present, he suddenly stands up from his chair and says, Jets get mehr and licked off, which translated, I got it, or now I understand, and writes down Y-O-G-T-Z-E and leaves. Later that night, he shows up in his favorite pub in Wilnsdorf. He orders a beer, but suddenly falls from his chair and hurts his face. Witnesses say that he was not drunk at this time. He leaves immediately after and shows up at 1 a.m. in Hager Seelbach where he grew up and knocked at the door of an old lady who was his former neighbor. She was known for her religiosity, and he was eager to come in and have a talk with her. According to her, he was talking about horrible incidents which will take place tonight. At the end, she didn't let him in because it was 1 a.m. and he seemed confused. At 3 a.m., two truck drivers found Stahl's damaged car in the roadside ditch of the Autobahn 45 near Hagen Sad. Both witnessed they saw four men in bright clothes walking around the wreck. They stopped, stepped out of their truck, and headed to the emergency telephone nearby at the side of the road to call for help. After that, they walked over to the wreck and found Stahl in his car. He was naked and heavily injured, but conscious. He said that there used to be other men with him in the car, but that they hit the road. He died in the ambulance on his way to the hospital. The police later found out that the deadly injury was not caused by the accident, but that someone had driven over him while he was already naked and later put him into his car. Till this day, no one knows what really happened that night and what the meaning of Y-O-G-T-Z-E is.